Good afternoon, and you're very welcome to the fifth lecture in the 2021 Bar of Ireland Green Street Lecture Series. I am delighted to introduce our fifth speaker, Ms. Justice Mary Rose Geerty, who is going to speak on the very interesting topic of evidential and societal impediments to a successful sorcery trial. So thank you very much, Ms. Justice Geerty. Hello. I want to look at an enduring myth about a couple of ferocious cats. I want to look at Ireland in the 1300s, England in the 1900s, and then we will return to the cats. On the way, we will consider what are the constituent parts of a successful trial and ask, did the sorcery trials fall short of those standards, not only of today's standards, but the standards of the time? I will now deliver a trigger warning and a spoiler alert. Some of the women referred to in this talk will be burned to death. And by the end of this story, we may be older. We certainly will be older. We may even be wiser. You can decide which of these is the trigger warning and which the spoiler alert. And so to the enduring myth of the cat's tails and a phenomenon that I call six degrees of John Philpot Curran. Everyone who was over the age of 10 in the 1990s probably knows that there are only six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Any Hollywood actor can be traced back to Kevin Bacon through tracing the two actors in the films in which they've appeared. Thus, Michael Fassbender, having starred with Bacon in X-Men First Class, has a Bacon factor of one. But Ian McKellen, having only starred with Fassbender and not directly with Kevin Bacon, has a Bacon factor of two. Similarly, in Irish legal history, we can trace any figure of the Irish legal landscape to Curran in six steps or less. One of the links between the earliest recorded sorcery trial in Ireland and the Green Street lecture series was John Philpott Curran. The earliest recorded sorcery trial is linked to Curran with a current factor of only two by my calculations. As you know, John Philpott Curran was one of the best known and most brilliant barristers in practice in the 1700s and 1800s. Some would say he was the most brilliant Irish trial lawyer ever. For those who have not yet listened to Patrick Gageby's lecture on the Shears brothers, which recounts some of Curran's bon mot and his victories in court, I will pause now to allow you to do so. Welcome back. As you've just heard, the Shears brothers were two of the United Irishmen who were executed in 1798. The brothers were both barristers and the retelling of their story in the very courtroom where they had been tried and sentenced to death was particularly poignant. Their barrister was John Philpott Curran. In 1817, Curran told the following tale, which was already by then a widely known myth. His biographer and son, William Curran, also a barrister, includes the reaction of his listeners in his retelling of Curran's story. William reports that Curran was at Cheltenham and the talk over dinner turned to cockfighting. And Curran told what his son describes as the incredible story of the Sligo cats. At a cat fight meeting, so the story goes, three pairs of cats fought on the first day. And before the third cat fight finished, on which bets ran very high, dinner was announced. The company agreed to leave the room, lock it and leave the key with Curran. On their return, Curran protested to God, he never was so shocked, and his heart was sunk within him when they found that the cats had actually eaten each other up, save some little bits of tails which were scattered around the room. His son William reports, the Irish part of the company in Cheltenham saw the drift, ridicule and impossibility of the narrative and laughed immoderately. <laughs> 
while the English part yawned and laughed seeing others laugh and sought relief in each other's countenances. So that is Curran's version of the enduring myth of the self-devouring cats. And in every other telling, the cats are from Kilkenny. This image from the United States Library of Congress by Mr. Pugh was published on the cover of Puck in 1904, and it depicts Japan and Russia as the Eastern Kilkennys. May the not hold. The phrase Kilkenny cats was sufficiently well known to readers in that time that readers would interpret it as a hope that the cats would destroy each other. So the story of the Kilkenny cats appeared first in the 1700s and apart from Curran's version, which we've just heard, it was always set in Kilkenny and the result was always the same. A fight so fierce that nothing but the tales of the cats remained. A further twist in this tale was that if one adversary was seen to have had the better of it in a fight in which nonetheless both were destroyed, that cat was said to have had the longer tail. So, having yanked this story pretty firmly into Green Street, there is one particular source of the tale that I wish to examine. The link with Green Street is Curran, obviously, but the story is one of a much earlier trial, and many of you will already have guessed as to why a pair of Kilkenny cats would introduce this tale. In 1857, the historian and archivist John Thomas Gilbert referred to the Kilkenny cat of Dame Alice. But the link between the Kilkenny cats, the myth repeated by Curran, and Dame Alice is made more strongly still in 1963 in a poem by Austin Clark, Beyond the Pale. Not just the name, the Kilkenny Cats, appears here, but the substance of the story is recounted and linked directly to Dame Alice. Clark was born just up the road from this venue in Manor Street in Stony Batter. And he recounts in Beyond the Pale a, a story about his trip through the southeast of Ireland. And during the poem, he concludes at one point that a demon contact of Dame Kittler sired the black cats of Kilkenny. They fought for scales of market fish, left nothing but their own tails, and their descendants never sit by the fireside. And so, with Dame Alice's cats appearing in one of Curran's stories in the 1800s, and therefore, by my calculation, with a current factor of two, via her mythical cats, and confirmed by Austin Clark, Alice Kittler's story is the story I'd like to tell as part of this Green Street lecture. In 13. 24, Dame Alice Kittler was indicted on a charge of witchcraft. Ireland of the 1300s was a country in which there had not been to that date, and indeed there wasn't any later, the same level of persecution of witches as occurred across Europe, a trend which peaked in the 1600s, in particular in Scotland. Before looking at Kilkenny and the cats of that city, demonic or otherwise, it is worth looking briefly at what was happening in Scotland, what happened later in particular in Scotland and across Europe, so as to see her trial in a broader historical context. So from the late 1500s, King James IV of Scotland, who became also King James I of England from 1603, was particularly vigilant when it came to witches. Macbeth, written in or around 1603, is believed to have been written with King James in mind. The witches, the true stars of Macbeth for many, uh, were based on a book of demonology written by King James in the throes of what appears to have been a fear amounting to paranoia first created in the king when storms assailed his ship on a voyage home from Holland. As to the real life witches, Roughly three quarters of those accused in the witch hunts which occurred across Europe were women, although some men were also implicated, either as accused witches or as associates of female witches. This persecution appears to have been driven by the theory, if I can state it very broadly, that the witches had entered into a pact with the devil and that they conspired to overthrow the existing social order. Heresy with bells on, you might say. Hell's bells, even. Uh, one commentator, Mui, uh, an economist, I'll refer to him later, uh, puts it thus, by the late 15th century, the notion that witchcraft was a deliberate, hidden and well-organised threat to society was well-established. 
as this notion assumed greater significance, it became common for the accused to be tortured and forced to name others who had attended Sabbaths. Sabbaths were mass meetings in which witches were thought to worship the devil. Commentators on witch trials point to the community origins of such suspicions. If a woman had been refused assistance, for instance, and then misfortune followed to the one who had refused her, and I must add, when did misfortune not befall all and sundry in the Middle Ages? The allegation against the woman was likely to follow. More convincingly, later commentators in the 70s and 80s, and I mean the 1970s and 80s, such as Norman Cohen, uh, point out that ordinary folk would never have pursued allegations in such numbers had there not been institutional buy-in, so to speak. It suited the church and the state to use the alleged menace of sorcery to expand their control, to enforce conformity with ideological norms, and to reinforce secular and religious power. What we know of the Irish trial of Alice Kittler confirms the church's involve involvement, but the main prosecutor in that story is one who either clearly believed strongly in the case he made, as he did risk his own liberty and property to pursue the case, or he was heavily invested in some other way, perhaps a personal investment, whether in power or in uh, money or other properties, for instance. Any theories which seek to explain the phenomenon of the witch hunt will only persuade if they take into account this likelihood that those who took part either believed in this cause or had a vested interest in the suppression of what appear to modernize to have been quite ordinary people, or both. Um, King James is a good example, and the Bishop of Ossory, Richard Ledred, is the next character we'll introduce, is another good example of this phenomenon. And finally, still by way of general background, to put the phenomenon in a social context, Gutenberg's printing press was invented in 1440, so over 100 years after Dame Alice's trial. And over the following 200 years, through, the, through to the 17th century, essentially, there was a huge surge in the transmission of information generally and in the uh, phenomenon of adult literacy. Grain and oats were the staple diet until the introduction of the potato in the 16th century, as depicted probably most memorably in Blackadder II in an episode entitled Potato. While public lighting had appeared by the 1500s, lighting still remained the preserve of cities and towns. It wasn't until the 1800s that private citizens began to light their homes other than by candlelight, which was expensive. It was in the 1930s, again by way of context, when rural Ireland was literally electrified. Um, I mention this because it's important to recall that it was dark in most places for most of the time in Ireland in the 14th century, and it wasn't much better by the 1600s in England and Scotland, save in large urban areas. I mentioned Macbeth and King James. Um, this fact of life, almost constant darkness, has been posited as the reason for the catalogue of accidents and misfortunes which attended so many performances of Macbeth, uh, that indeed it has led to a general view that the, the play itself is cursed, and so much so that those in the acting business will not refer to the play by name, but call it the Scottish play. Sensibly, in my view, some commentators have pointed out that as the play is performed in almost constant darkness, it's hardly surprising that there is an above average occurrence of trips and falls. Any good lawyer would have advised Shakespeare to raise the stage lights and reduce that risk. In Ireland in the 1300s, and again recall 300 years before the witch hunting trend peaked, this fear of the occult was observed, the same fear that was later seen across Europe in later centuries and persisted in some continents around the world, indeed up until today. There is no evidence, however, of a sustained campaign to identify and execute witches in a systemic way in Ireland. This is perhaps explained by the more tenuous nature of the power wielded by various rulers in Ireland at the time um, and the absence of a unifying force, such as King James, leading the charge against sorcery. So without that confluence of fear and power, uh, there was less scope for the kind of campaign that saw men appointed by the church or state to find and eliminate witches. And I can't help but think as I say that of uh, Dr. Richard Kimball, 
uh, to be found and not necessarily eliminated by Tommy Lee Jones uh, in his wonderful, uh, I suppose, successor of the, of the Witchfinder General. The role of the Chancellor in Ireland in the 1300s and indeed for many years thereafter was to be the representative of the English King in Ireland. In the early 1300s, that Chancellor was a man called Roger Outlaw. He had forged alliances with most of the significant families in Ireland, or at least enough of them, to hold the others at bay. The church was very powerful and had its own structures and hierarchies. And while Outlaw appears to have been a cleric also, he was primarily a military man and a judge. Women were the usual targets of an allegation of witchcraft or sorcery. The suspect wasn't necessarily poor, and in many documented cases, it can be easy to identify the motives for the accusation. Envy, greed, and revenge often featured. Dame Alice Kittler, to whom we finally turn, you say to yourselves, was an unusual woman in 1324 in three respects. She kept her maiden name. She married four times, and she had money. Dame Kittler is described in a book called Witchcraft and Demonology, written in 1913, to which I'll refer again. She's described as one who must have been far removed from the popular conception of a witch as an old woman of striking ugliness, or else her powers of attraction were very remarkable, for she had succeeded in leading four husbands to the altar. Her husbands were, in order of marriage and death, William Outlaw, a banker. Remember that surname. Adam LeBlond said to hail from Callan. Many of you will know it, just outside Kilkenny, a lovely spot. Richard Deval and Sir John Lepuer, whose surname will also recur in this tale. Those first three of the four husbands, she was said to have dispatched with poison, and the last she deprived of his natural senses by filters and incantations. These were the charges against her. The Franciscan Bishop of Ossory at the time was an Englishman. Richard Ledred, or Richard de Ledred, sometimes called Leatherhead. Dame Alice's stepchildren, the children of her first three husbands, but by earlier marriages, were her accusers. They accused her of consorting with the devil and denying the Christian faith. Ledred, the Bishop of Ossory, was led to believe that Dame Alice Kittler was not acting alone, but was leading a group of sorcerers and heretics in the town of Kilkenny. They were said to meet by night and to consort with the devil. Cats and other demons were said to be involved. Her maid, Petronella, and Petronella's daughter, Basilia, were also indicted. I have already mentioned Austin Clarke, the poet from Manor Street. Let me briefly return to his poem, Beyond, Beyond the Pale, in which he describes what Dame Kittler and Petronella and others were said to have done. Dame Alice, he recounts, scoffed at mass, stripped to the pelt, and the devil came to her, taking her by the loblongs. Petronella, Black Fitz James, that demon sired the black cats of Kilkenny. She wanted topsy-turvy or orgy. In the same section of the poem, incidentally, the poet lauds marital love by way of contrast with this kind of satanic orgy and carry on. This is an interesting irony, given that Dame Alice married more often than anyone I have ever met. Much to my disappointment, I have never met Zsa, Zsa Gabor. So marital love, you could say, was Dame Alice's downfall. The first allegation then made by her, but made against her by the Bar Bishop of Ossory, was that of denying the faith of Christ. The second, offering sacrifice of living animals to a demon named the Son of Art. And the third, seeking responses from demons and imitating church ceremonies. The evidence to support these various charges was that Dame Alice had mixed powders and entrails of sacrificial cocks, combined them with herbs, and cooked the lot in the skull of a decapitated thief. Now, I've mentioned her accusers, her stepchildren. Um, I should clarify, William Outlaw was her first husband, as you may recall, and her son by him, also, William was her favourite child. It may come as no surprise, perhaps, that it was William, her, probably her first child, and if not her first child, almost certainly her first son, because he bore his father's name. It was this child who was to inherit all her wealth. 
Her adult stepchildren accused Dame Alice not only of consorting with the devil, but of killing their fathers and having tricked those men into leaving all their wealth to William. Dame Alice had been seen, it was said, sweeping at all hours of the day and night towards William's door, muttering secretly with herself, to the house of William, my son, high all the wealth of Kilkenny town. How these secret words were overheard is not related. The evidence against Dame Alice was composed entirely, initially, of these allegations by disappointed stepchildren. But the charges were soon augmented by confessions after torture on the part of her co-accused. A quick digression into torture in the medieval trial. During this period, the threat of witchcraft was taken so seriously and one commentator says it was thought to be so severe that trial safeguards were abandoned. This is Ve Lamui. I mentioned his name earlier. He's a behavioural economist who has written on the phenomenon of witch hunts. Uh, and very interestingly, I might add, he gives the example of a German imperial law code of 1532, which provided that no one could be tortured without proper cause. And he goes on to point out that witch trials did not feature these apparently mandatory safeguards for the accused. He posits that as witches were usually accused of conspiring with the devil, difficult to prove, and not simply practicing harmful witchcraft, somewhat easier to prove, judges began to see torture as the only effective way to extract confessions. And so he concludes by the end of the 16th century, the use of torture in such trials was widely accepted in Germany. This is all set out in an article, uh, in every way very interesting, called Information, Civil Liberties and the Political Economy of Witch Hunts. The truth in respect of torture and the trial process may be somewhat different. Torture remained lawful throughout most of Europe into the 1700s and 1800s in the context specifically of gathering evidence, not just in terms of uh, punishment or execution indeed. In April of 1905, the Scottish History Review was published and contained an extensive description of what was described as the use and forms of judicial torture. The authors, having documented the gradual move against the use of evidence obtained after torture, the authors conclude that its use was common in ancient Greece, and they refer to the rack and the wheel, and then they note that the civil law strictly regulated the use of torture. Its rules were precise as to the stage at which torture was to be applied, its amount, the physique and age of the subject, the nature of the queries to be put at different stages of the examination, the conduct of the sufferer, the circumstances of his confession, and the relation of the accuser. There was a useful restraint uh, to deter vexatious and frivolous accusations of treason. If an accuser failed to prove the case in treason, the accuser was liable to be tortured in turn. The same deterrent did not apply to a sorcery allegation. The principal tortures at the time were the rack, thumb screws, plumbate or leaden darts, and fidiculae. I'm, I, I'm certainly led to believe this by uh, certain uh, researches in particular into uh, the uh, Scottish History Review, but the fidiculae, I also understand, is a small stringed instrument, which seems a little unlikely, but my understanding of the use of the term in this context is that they were cords which compressed the arms. All of these methods of torture had later European counterparts. Most of them had nicknames. Kind of interesting, actually. Uh, the rack, which was supposed to have been introduced uh, into England by the Duke of Exeter, was commonly referred to as the Duke of Exeter's daughter. And a hoop of iron, which compressed the subject within it by the small of the back, and kneeling on, under his feet. Um, that was introduced by someone called Skevington, Lord Skevington, and that was nicknamed Scavenger's Daughter, and a similar construction in Germany was referred to as the Iron Maiden. So I have to say I briefly considered showing pictures of these devices, but they were so horrendous I decided against it. Various English statutes over the centuries appeared to prohibit torture, but Bracton, writing in the 13th century on the laws and customs of England, divides corporal punishment into that inflicted with and that inflicted without torture. 
The sensible conclusion appears to be that even though torture was apparently uh, forbidden or ostensibly forbidden by statute and was certainly disavowed by distinguished jurists uh, by the time of Queen Elizabeth I, if not by uh, the time of King James, um, there was ample evidence from contemporary writers and from state papers that throughout the 15th and 16th centuries, practice did not marry theory. The piece in the Scottish History Review concludes quite quaintly that torture was constantly used as an instrument of evidence in the investigation of offences without scruple and without question as to its legality. And that despite his sentiments and disavowal of torture, Sir Edward Coke, Attorney General in 1603, appears from state documents to have personally conducted an examination of an accused person by torture on the rack. By the late 1600s, commentators had begun to question and criticise the methodology of the typical witch trial, and in particular, the use of torture to force an accused witch to confess. It may be of some comfort to an audience of lawyers to know that the most frequent convictions and burnings in Scotland were imposed by lay tribunals of the time. The gentry acting as judges in local affairs, they executed up to 90% of those who were accused of witchcraft who appeared before them. The more professional lawyers and judges with some training in law at the time had a much more modest total of up to a, a, about half of those who appeared in front of them. Perhaps not a great result, but these things are, I suppose, comparative um, or relative. We were not alone in Ireland in terms of uh, torture, therefore, and we were about to hear the fate of Petronella, but it was common, certainly on, the, on, on those uh, reviews of the, of the situation, it was common right across Europe. So returning to Dame Alice, the Bishop Le Dredd wasn't a witch finder in any general sense, but he was the match of Hopkins in many ways, insofar as Alice Kittler was concerned, for his enthusiasm as a prosecutor. However, as we've already seen, he lacked institutional backup, so to speak. From the Bishop of Ossory's point of view, the position was somewhat worse when it came to Alice Kittler. It wasn't just that he didn't have institutional backup or endorsement. The Chancellor of Ireland, representative of the, of the English King in Ireland, and thus one of the most powerful men in the country at that time, was Roger Outlaw. Certainly a relation, and in some accounts, a brother of the deceased William Outlaw, Dame Alice's first husband, and therefore certainly a relation and probably the uncle of William Outlaw, who was to inherit all of the wealth of Dame Alice. So the younger William, to whom she was sweeping her wealth, um, was to benefit from this sorcery if the bishop was right. So somewhat implausibly, and possibly even recklessly, the Bishop Le Dredd sought to persuade Uncle Roger, the Chancellor, to indict and to execute his sister-in-law, all of whose considerable wealth was bequeathed to his nephew. Sir Arnold Lepoir, probably a relation of the last husband, John Lepoir, joined with the Chancellor, Uncle Roger Altlow, in opposing the Bishop's demand that Dame Alice be arrested. The Bishop nonetheless cited her for sorcery and Dame Alice fled temporarily. Foiled thus far, Le Dredd cited William the Younger, her son, for heresy. Sir Arnold Lepoir, probably a relation of the last husband, John Lepoir, joined with the Chancellor, Uncle, Rich, Uncle Roger Outlaw, in opposing the Bishop's demand that Dame Alice be arrested. The Bishop nonetheless cited Alice for sorcery and she fled temporarily. Foiled thus far, the Bishop Le Dredd cited William the Younger, her son, for heresy. Now, there was no accomplice warning at the time, and the evidence of Dame Alice's maid, Petronella, was that she, the maid, had consorted with demons, but that her mistress, Dame Alice, was far more involved in demonology than poor Petronella. Sir Arnold's support uh, was lent to William Outlaw, and they entreated and then threatened the Bishop Le Dredd. Stephen Lepoir, another relative of Arnold Lepoir, and probably therefore a relative of husband number three, John Lepoir, was a bailiff. So Stephen the bailiff intercepted the bishop the next day and arrested him. The bishop was lodged in Kilkenny jail, according to one account, causing tremendous excitement in the city. <laughs> 
If you had, until now, been vaguely picturing the Bishop of Ossory, Richard Ledred, Le de Ledred, as a kind of medieval judge dread, a lone enforcer figure, the following scene will disabuse you of that notion. Drelincourt Seymour, writing in the 1900s, but taking his account from the bishop himself, tells us that the sacrament was brought to the bishop at his request in solemn procession. All the clergy, secular and religious, flocked from every side to the prison to offer their consolation to the captive. A Dominican preached the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are they which are per persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This appears to have been a deliberate show of power, a very calculated display of the influence and popular support enjoyed by the church. And it had its effect. 17 days later, Ledred was liberated. And in the words of Seymour, St. John Drelincourt Seymour, uh, author of Witchcraft and Demonology, the bishop refused to sneak out like a released felon, but assumed his pontificals and accompanied by all the clergy and a throng of people, he made his way solemnly to St. Camus's Cathedral, where he gave thanks to God. And then with a pertinacity that the 1913 author Seymour admires, despite his brief spell of imprisonment, the bishop again cited William Outlaw by public proclamation to appear before him. It may be nearer to the truth to see the bishop as having been emboldened by this show of strength rather than to admire his pertinacity. But before William Outlaw, the favourite son, could appear, the bishop himself was cited to answer a separate charge against him from the civil authority, the charge of having placed an interdict on the diocese, an ecclesiastical ban, which could be applied to a person or a locality. Le Dred declined to go initially, saying his life would be in danger if he did. But then later, he appeared before the Seneschal in court in Kilkenny, fully robed and carrying the sacrament in a golden vase, where the Seneschal called him a vile, rustic, interloping monk with his dirt, which he is carrying in his hands, and refused to hear him. Just to pause here, given the power of the church at that time, these were words which only a very powerful civil authority would have uttered, or would risk indeed. The modern court equivalent of this series of events, of events is, is actually difficult to imagine. Uh, perhaps a senior judge summoning a bishop, um, but perhaps this would no longer carry that kind of frisson, only perhaps. By modern standards, certainly by the standards of the day, this was an extraordinary clash at a very high level. It was also almost certainly engineered by the Chancellor of Ireland, Roger Outlaw, who continued, not surprisingly, to take an interest in this case. And by some accounts, it was he who directly ensured that Dame Alice did not stand trial. She reappeared in Dublin and some sort of mediation appears to have been arranged between Sir Arnold Le Poer and the Bishop Le Dredd, but no lasting peace broke out and the Bishop again went to the Chancellor still Chancellor Outlaw, demanding Dame Alice's arrest, and again she fled, this time to England, where, according to Seymour, she spent the remainder of her days unmolested. A group of associates, mainly women, most of whom were described as being of humble condition of life, were arrested and imprisoned as her co-accused. Dame Alice's maid, Petronella, and Petronella's daughter, Basilia, were amongst this number. Although there are other accounts which tell that Dame Alice was able to ensure Basilia's escape. A telling description of what happened next, albeit without mention of exactly how the confessions emerged, is repeated here. The bishop interviewed the group and they all immediately confessed to the charges laid against them and even went to the length of admitting other crimes of which no mention had been made, but according to them, Dame Alice was the mother and mistress of them all. Poor Petronella of Meath, Alice's maid, was flogged through six parishes, according to the bishop's own account, after which method of extracting evidence she made the required confession of magical practices. She admitted denying her faith, 
She admitted sacrificing to a demon and causing certain women of her acquaintance to appear as if they had goat's horns. She implicated Dame Alice in all her activities, saying that she had frequently consulted demons and received responses from them. Petronilla alleged that she and her mistress had applied a magical potion to a wooden beam which enabled both women to fly. She made a public proclamation that Kittler and her follow followers were all guilty of witchcraft. And she concluded that she, Petronilla, was as nothing in comparison with the dame from whom she had learnt all her knowledge, and that there was no one in the world more skilful than she. She also stated that William Outlaw deserved death as much as she, for he was privy to their sorceries. Now, Drelincourt Seymour concludes, torture as a means of extracting evidence was never used upon witches in Ireland, accepting the treatment of Petronilla of Meath by Bishop Dilla Dredd, which seems to have been carried out in what may be termed a purely unofficial manner. I do not share the author's confidence about either the frequency of the employment of the method or the purely unofficial manner in which it was carried out. Howsoever, by June of 19, excuse me, by June of 1324, there was another tussle between the bishop and the chancellor and finally the justiciary had to hear the case when he came to Kilkenny. The bishop summonsed William Outlaw yet again to appear in St Mary's Church. And this is June of 1324. William Outlaw appeared, accompanied by a band of men armed to the teeth. Ladred accused him, amongst other charges, of heresy. The full account of the trial is so brief that it can be given here. And again, looking at uh, Seymour, uh, Drelincourt's account, Drelincourt Seymour in 1913, borrowing heavily from the bishop's own account of what had occurred. On the 2nd of July, still in 1324, on the 2nd of July, accompanied by the Chancellor, the bishop recited the charges against Dame Alice and with the common consent of the lawyers present, declared her to be a sorceress, magician and heretic and demanded that she should be handed over to the secular arm and have her goods and chattels confiscated. William, despite backing from the Chancellor and the Treasurer, was compelled to submit on bended knee. The records reveal the fate of some of Dame Alice's accomplices. She had not returned, you'll recall, to face trial, so in her absence she was thus uh, convicted and sentenced. On the 3rd of November of the same year, 1324, showing an admirable speed in terms of her trial in due course of law, whatever about any other aspect of the rule of law, Petronilla was burnt alive at the stake. This was the first instance of punishment of death by fire in Ireland for heresy. The fate of William, the favourite son, was somewhat different. He was sentenced to hear at least three masses every day for a year, to feed a specific number of poor people and to cover a portion of the roof of St Canis's Cathedral with lead. He agreed to do this but then failed to abide by those conditions and was cast into prison. Others of the group of Dame Alice's followers were burnt. Some were merely solemnly whipped through the town. Others were banished. Those who escaped, including Dame Alice herself, were excommunicated. Sir Arnold Le Poir, having attempted to thwart the bishop, was himself excommunicated and committed to prison in Dublin Castle a 15 minute gentle stroll, as an estate agent would tell you, from this very spot. The trial of Dame Alice and her accomplices predated any formal witchcraft statute in Ireland. It relied on ecclesiastical law, whereby witchcraft was treated as heresy. And by the end of this tale, the tables had turned to some extent. Le Dredd was himself accused of heresy. He appealed to the Holy See and set out in person for Avignon where the Pope then resided. Le Dred was exiled, his properties were seized by the crown, and having found favour with the crown again, yet again he was accused and had to uh, appear before the crown to explain himself. So twice within a decade, uh, his temporalities were seized, as they say, so his properties were effectively uh, ceded to the crown. He did recover favour before his death, and his turbulent episcopate ended in 1360. He lies buried in Canis's Cathedral in Kilkenny. <laughs>
His reign, Richard le Dred as Bishop of Ossory, coincided with the reign of John XXII as Pope. That Pope was perhaps the King James figure whose influence may have animated the Bishop of Ossory. It is recorded that this Pope anathematized sorcerers, denouncing their ill deeds, excited inquisitors against them, and gave ecclesiastical authorization to the reality of the belief in magical forces. I have quoted quite extensively from Witchcraft and Demonology by St. John Drelincourt Seymour, and he concludes that possibly Dame Alice and her associates actually tried to practice magical arts, but it is to be feared, his words, that de la Dred was to some extent swayed by such baser motives as greed of gain and desire for revenge. And to be fair to the author, he does also allow that the discontent and anger of the disinherited children at the loss of the wealth of which Dame Alice had bereft them by her exercise of undue influence over her husbands, family quarrels, private hatreds, and possibly national jealousy are all very probable causes of the charges against Dame Alice and her unfortunate associates. If there were other cases of sorcery in Ireland at the time, he concludes, they had no historian to immortalise them. The Irish Parliament passed a statute prohibiting the practice of witchcraft in 1586 and provided that a person would suffer pain of death without benefit of clergy and all their heirs would lose all rights and titles if their witchcraft resulted in the death or destruction of a person. If they only managed to lame, waste or consume a person, or if the goods or chattels of such a person were destroyed or impaired, then the witch would serve a year without bail and stand in the pillory of a market town once a quarter on market day for six hours. That was for a first offence. On a second such offence, the penalty was to suffer death as a felon. Harsh as that may sound, looking at other statutes of the period and considering the mood of the time, this could be seen as a relatively mild uh, prohibition. No mention is made of torture to extract ev evidence and recall that at the time the penalty laid down for the felon, um, hang, draw and quarter the men, strangle and then burn the women. So more merciful at least than burning them alive. Um, this was the only statute against witchcraft passed by the Irish Parliament and as far as I know it has not been repealed but is unlikely to, to survive a challenge to its constitutionality. By way of postscript to the tale of Dame Alice, in 1944, Helen Duncan, often referred to as the last witch in England, was in fact the second last woman prosecuted under the Witchcraft Act of 1735. Not for witchcraft, but for the crime of pretending to be a witch. Not unlike Dame Alice, there was a theory that her prosecution was political rather than the disinterested operation of the law. In 1941, it was alleged that a dead sailor had manifested himself at one of her seances and announced that the ship, the Barham, on which he had sailed, had sank. HMS Barham was not officially declared lost until later that year, and obviously recall Britain was then at war with Germany. It hadn't been officially declared lost, both to mislead the enemy and to protect British morale. Some years later, um, one of this lady, Helen Duncan's seances was raided by police and she was arrested. Uh, she was convicted and the sentence, which I'll come to presently, is worth considering in the context again of the kind of offence alleged against her. She was taking in paying clients on the basis that when in a trance, uh, loved ones known to them but now dead may appear and speak directly but through her she being the medium through which they would speak to their, to their relatives. Um, she also claimed that when in a trance, a substance known as ectoplasm would be visible to those in the room and could take the form of a spirit. Anyone who has seen Ghostbusters is familiar with this substance. As one commentator, Brian McConnell, points out, these alleged offences took place in naval Portsmouth at a time of war when parents were anxiously seeking lost sons, presuming that they were missing or dead at sea. So one can certainly understand a certain public uh, outrage at, at the suggestion that this uh, was a fraudulent practice. 
Ms Duncan was originally charged under Section 4 of the Vagrancy Act of 1824, and Irish audiences I know will be very familiar with this uh, in terms of its constitutional uh, background. But under Section 4, most charges of fortune-telling, astrology and spiritualism were prosecuted um, by magistrates under Section 4 of the Vagrancy Act at the time. Uh, it was considered a relatively petty charge and convictions usually resulted in a fine. Helen Duncan, having been tried by a jury at the Old Bailey for uh, an offence under the Witchcraft Act, uh, was now, unfortunately, potentially, uh, looking at a much more severe penalty, including imprisonment. She um, was specifically accused of having pretended to exercise conjuration so that the, uh, through her agency, deceased persons should appear to be present. Now, I don't know about any other prosecutor thinking about how that might be proven, but um, uh, that is a certainly a chilling thought in terms of how one would even begin an advice on proofs on how to uh, uh, prosecute Helen Duncan. She was also charged with offences under the Larceny Act, uh, taking money by falsely pretending that she was in a position to bring about the appearances of the spirits of deceased persons. The trial, unsurprisingly, was a media sensation. It spawned numerous witch-themed cartoons. And at one stage, the defence announced that Duncan was prepared to conduct a seance in court, or at least in front of the jury, in order to prove her abilities. The offer was declined. Helen Duncan was found guilty and sentenced to nine months in Holloway Prison. On appeal, the Court of Appeal upheld the ruling of the recorder to the effect that the jury should not see a, re a reenactment to demonstrate her various skills. The court found it hard to see how the ectoplasm would have been verified, and I am going to quote from the uh, judgment. I found it, again, for lawyers, it's particularly interesting. The Court of Appeal said, the difficulty of arranging such a demonstration, satisfactory in all its details to both sides, is obvious. To mention only one matter, if in the course of the demonstration, ectoplasm was to be alleged to emanate from the medium, would the jury be allowed to handle it? or to do anything to verify the appearance? Or would the jury have to be content with what they could see in a dim light, such as was provided on the occasions in question? Helen Duncan's sentence was affirmed. She was the last person to be jailed under the Act, which was repealed in 1951, and it was replaced with the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Hilary Mantel has written very movingly about the trial, but more particularly about Miss Duncan herself, and her husband and business partner. Her family continues to campaign to clear her name. Uh, the fraud in question, incidentally, in monetary terms, was the extraction of 12 shillings and sixpence per person at these events. Lady Eleanor Smith, a daughter of a former Lord, Lord Chancellor, said of the judgment of the Court of Appeal at the time that it was a disgrace to British justice and another detestable attempt to interfere with our personal liberty. I'm only astounded that she wasn't sentenced to be burnt at the stake. As is clear from both trials, we've looked at briefly here, Dame Alice accused of being a witch, Helen Duncan accused of not being a witch. Neither story ends well. One fled and her maid was burnt to death. The other was imprisoned for extracting small sums of money for a display of conjuration. Could either be said to have been a successful trial? In terms of these results and the process whereby the relevant law purported to prohibit the impossible or to punish those who claimed that they could achieve the impossible, or at least the impossible to prove. The validity of the charges in Duncan's trial rather depend on a modern certainty that there is no such thing as communing with spirits. This is just as difficult to prove as that the accused has been communing with the devil and is therefore a witch. In each case, the harm actually done by the accused, it seems to me, is obscured by the fear of the unknown and the prejudice against the practice of such spiritualists, for want of a better term. As to the fear of the occult, which informed many such trials, the trials were most effective and most brutal when backed by institutional campaigns against such practices. The attempts to fight human representatives of invisible enemies, uh, such entities being beyond the scope of forensic methods of proof and therefore impossible to establish, let alone prove, these trials wholly removed from a concept of forensic proof 
or evidence are reminiscent of the Kilkenny cats. This is why I opened with that particular reference, fighting until only the tales remain. With confessions and accusations obtained through torture, accusers who were personally or institutionally invested in the result, and clearly, in many, if not all cases, a series of unfortunate accused persons admitting to what most would accept is impossible. There can be no historical example, it seems to me, of a successful sorcery trial. Right up to 1944, when Helen Duncan was imprisoned for pretending to have such powers in a trial which provoked protests and ridicule in equal measure. Whatever the societal fears and institutional interests which lead to the prosecution of wit witches and have done so for centuries, the thousands wrongly accused and executed as a result, with little to show by way of societal benefit, again, remind me of the mythical cats, Nobody comes out of these trials well, neither the system nor those who are tried. In a system which admits confessions extracted by torture or prosecutes for a crime that cannot be proven, or for conduct which is either ill-defined or does little or no harm, is a gross failure of the rule of law. There may be success in monetary terms, or even in terms of enduring power for an institution, uh, for those who create and administer such a system, but I don't think it can be said to be successful in human terms, though it must be said that the witches came out of it rather worse, and those with no money or connections, such as poor Petronella, came out of it worst of all. The prosecutors, whether state or churchmen, even if they too fought until their own system had no credibility, they at least physically survived the ordeal, and in some cases, uh, indeed in many cases, continued to rule for many years thereafter. So in the language of the mythical cats, they had the longer tales. Having outlined the story of the Kilkenny cats and two perhaps tenuously connected trials, I did want to finish by playing a small excerpt of a song. In 1983, The Cure released the song Love Cats, which is a wonderful piece and one I'd have loved you to hear at the close of this talk. But sadly, a call and an email to the publisher have gone unanswered, so I have no permission to play the excerpt. Those of you who have access to Spotify might consider selecting the song while they contemplate the strategy to employ when a person or an institution wants to succeed and whether, apart from fighting until none but the longest tale remains, there might be a better way. 